We open the God's Word this morning with two passages from the pen of Moses, beginning with Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. Please follow along as I read. And it will be helpful if I put something up there to read. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And then from chapter 10 of Leviticus, verses 1 to 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Let's pray. Our Father and our King, we come to you this morning prepared to receive your word. Enlighten us where we need enlightening. Convict us where we need conviction. Transform us where we need transformation. Propel us to act where we need propelling. And enable us where we need enabling. In your sons and our Redeemer's name we pray. Amen. Before we embark on today's journey... We would do well to briefly review the journey we have taken thus far. You may recall that we began this series by examining Hebrews 12, 18 to 24, arguably the most compelling description of true worship to be found in the entirety of Scripture. In it, the author recalls the spectacle of Moses' visit with God on Mount Sinai. The fire, the darkness, the gloom, the winds, the lightning, the thunderous voice, such that Moses experienced exceeding fear and trembling. Then, After reminding his readers of the expectations placed on the Israelites, the critical importance of boundaries and purification, etc., the writer shifts focus and he brings the experience closer to home. But you, he writes, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, 
the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. I invite you to notice the present perfect tense, have come. Not will come, might come, should come someday in the future. But that's impossible, you say. Surely there's been a mistake in the translation. I'm not in the city of the living God. I'm not on Mount Zion. Well, all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God and is profitable. There's something there for us to grasp. Whether we gather in God's house as we are today, or whether we gather another place to worship the king, we are participating in a practice session, if you will, for worship in the heavenly courts. Notice, to the humble, believing soul, what? The house of God on earth is what? The gate of heaven. The song of praise, the prayer, the words spoken by Christ's representatives are God's appointed agencies to prepare a people for the church above, for that loftier worship into which there can enter nothing that defileth. So how does one prepare for the church above? Well, first of all, you'll recall, two weeks ago we suggested that you prepare by getting to know, really know, the one you are worshiping. And that only comes by spending significant quality time digesting his word, the Bible. In reflecting on the Sinai experience, the author there in Hebrews 12, he makes it very clear that the God whose thunderous voice shook the earth in Moses' day will shake the earth again, at which time the old will pass away to make room for a new kingdom that cannot be shaken. And a few verses earlier, he underscores the importance of paying close attention when God speaks. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. The author then concludes his narrative by counseling us to offer God acceptable worship. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God what? Acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. Well, that's the review. All of that brings us to today's lessons. The inspired text says it behooves us to worship God in an acceptable manner in keeping with his kingship, his lordship, his divine nature. 
And whatever other characteristics you want to assign to this word acceptable, whatever other characteristics acceptable worship might possess, the wording is clear about two things. What are they? It will be engaged in with reverence and awe. So, we ask the question of the Lord, tell us what are reverence and awe? Although the original languages of Hebrew and Greek are not often translated into these specific words, the Bible does speak to the necessity of reverent, awe-filled worship. For example, after Joshua had reminded the children of Israel how the Lord had successfully led them across the Red Sea, he declared that God's mighty hand had been exercised so that the peoples of the earth may know without any doubt and acknowledge that the hand of the Lord is mighty and extraordinarily powerful so that you will fear the Lord your God and obey and worship him with profound awe and reverence. How long? Forever. Forever. Note the parenthetic emphasis the Amplified Bible places on the phrase, Fear the Lord your God. I know a lot of folk who don't like that word. They would like to drop it from their religious vocabulary. Fear? Scripture tells us that we need not fear fear. If we look elsewhere in the Bible, we discover that the focus is on another equally impactful descriptor, the English word glory. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord and the splendor of holiness. Old and New Testaments combine the use of the word glory and its derivatives from Hebrew and Greek. That word or its similar phrases appears over 600 times in your Bible. Most of these mentions are in the context of God's character, his majesty, his splendor, his being, his existence, his perfection, his holiness, his creative power, his love. In other words, all the things that make God God are subsumed in that word glory. The term is likewise used in reference to Jesus, co-member of the Godhead and possessing the same qualities as the Father. And finally, it is sometimes used in Scripture as a call to you and I to live lives fully committed to and reflective of him. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word most often translated glory is kabod, which in its various grammatical forms occurs 200 times in the Old Testament. It's a term fraught with social and moral implications. And at its very root, kabod portrays the idea of weightiness or heaviness. We use weighty or heavy in a vernacular sense, even in our modern culture. 
for example, if we hear a speaker say something that we think is extraordinarily insightful or profound, we may respond with, wow, that's heavy. Or in the case of school grades, a student might say, the teacher gave more weight to the term paper than she did to the test scores. In other words, kavod in the Old Testament, when translated as God's glory, refers to the significance, the import of his majesty, his dignity, his honor, and his holiness. It is variously used, even today, where Hebrew is spoken, to ascribe respect and distinction both toward man and God. This uh, weighty glory, if you will, should be seen as abounding in limitless honor and reverence to a level that may indeed be viewed as terrifying, as was Moses' experience there in the wilderness. Scripture also reveals that kavod can be seen or unseen. Indeed, God revealed his kavod, his glory, in the cloud, in the pillar of fire, that went before the Israelites on their sojourn. Those seen manifestations of his glory inspired no small amount of fear and awe among them. Exodus 24, 17 is a prime example of this. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Likewise, God tangibly showed his kavod by providing bread from heaven, water from a rock, healing from poisonous serpents, victories in battle. Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35, indicate that the glory of God can also be tangibly felt. Moses writes there about a cloud signifying God's presence that covered the tent of meeting and filled the tabernacle. So much so that Moses says, I was unable to enter the tent of meeting. And just as God's glory filled the tabernacle in those days, a few centuries later, Solomon's temple, when it was dedicated was filled with kavod, God's glory. Sometimes God's presence is visible like that. Other times it is sensed. When God's kavod is sensed, it serves as a signal to the human soul, to you and to, to me, that God is worthy of the utmost respect. His glory, also referred in some places in Scripture, referred to as the majesty of God, should activate in us a response of reverence and awe.
As previously mentioned, that word kavod is most often translated into the words glory or glorious. But in modern dialogue, the term glory conjures mental pictures of grand vistas and beauty and opulence and supreme success and, and prestige and fame. But in a scriptural context, in addition to magnificence and greatness and splendor and honor and respect, and distinction, the word kavod most often implies great worth or value that results in a spontaneous outpouring of praise. In the New Testament, the Greek word doxa has a similar meaning, and it is translated into the word glory or glorious about 160 times. It too implies a certain weightiness, or in the Greek, gravitas, that should inform our worship. Further, these terms are used to refer to God's creative power, both in his creative acts and in the recreation of you and me to reflect his image. The Bible uses glory to describe the reflection of God's character in his creation. For example, the heavens declare what? The glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. And that glory also appears in the transformation of believers' hearts and lives. Translated in this and other passages as the glory of God, Kavod describes the infinite nature, the weight, if you will, of all that God is. The Puritan preacher Jonathan Edwards, back in the 18th century, put it this way. Oh my goodness, I went shooting past it. There we go. The Creator is what? <laughs> infinite. This means he has all possible existence, perfection, and excellence. This means he must also have all possible honor and respect. In every way, God is first and supreme. His excellent qualities are the supreme beauty and glory, the original good, and the fountain of all good. This, of course, means that he must in every way have the highest regard and honor. Despite the somewhat awkward translation of Pastor Edwards' words from Old English into Modern English, the idea remains clear. God is unquestionably worthy of high esteem, significant value, great respect. As the psalmist puts it, Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. No wonder the prophet Isaiah was awestruck as he saw in vision the seraphim above God's throne singing, Holy, holy, holy. is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Unfortunately, left to our own devices and encumbered by the ravages of sin, humans are not naturally inclined to show reverence to exhibit respect, to bestow honor to anyone or anything. 
this is something that God had to teach or prescribe in a manner of speaking. And the laws God gave to the children of Israel partly served to demonstrate the need to give him glory and describe the manner in which giving him glory should be carried out. Today, however, many so-called Christians, dare I say most, have abandoned the voice of the Lord as preserved in Scripture. For even though they know God, they do not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they become futile in their expectations and their foolish heart is darkened. Today, all too often, Christians cherry pick from the Bible. seeking to make it their own, to have it say what their itching ears want to hear. And at times they even dare to paraphrase parts or the whole of Scripture in an effort to enhance or improve upon the voice of God. They are marching on Satan's ground. And that attitude has even permeated the so-called Christian church when it comes to worship and lifestyle issues. Some say we are in the worship war era of Christianity. Still others say, oh, those battles have already been lost. For some time now, tension has existed And yes, in the Adventist church as well. And though perhaps late in arriving, it seems to be growing ever stronger in our church. Tension has existed in congregations to design and conduct worship in a fashion to appeal to the secular mind, to break down perceived barriers between God and man, to minimize or altogether eradicate the fearsome holiness of God described in the Old Testament, and to avoid at all costs a God which might, as he did to Moses, cause us to tremble. Seeker-sensitive worship, we call it. Intended to make the non-Christian more comfortable in the presence of Christians. Innovate, import, entertain, socialize, install bigger, brighter, and louder audiovisual systems, drop the lesson study, minimize preaching, bring out the coffee and donuts. Do anything to get one more person in the door. Now that approach may, and I, and I say may very reluctantly, it may be appropriate to some degree for evangelism and outreach. But when our worship loses its gravitas, its weightiness. It's a loss we cannot recover from. Those things have no place in corporate worship. As we learned in the first installment of this series, worship on Sabbath mornings is primarily for believers, the body of Christ assembled together to ascribe honor and praise to their God 
and his son, their redeemer. The unbeliever is certainly welcome to be present. But worship must not be designed to please either the believer or the unbeliever. It must be designed to please the one we worship. All that is done must be done in spirit and in truth and must reflect a certain gravity, if you will, a certain solemnity that truly honors with reverence and awe our heavenly King. If there is one attitude or attribute, excuse me, if there is one attribute of God above all others that should inform our thinking about worship, I would suggest that that attribute is holiness. This is what defines God's character. This is what he asks us to reflect of him. Recognition of his holiness should be unmistakably manifest in how we respond to him. Yes, God is omnipresent. He can be both beyond us and with us. But he is not an absent God, an aloof God. He's not ready to pounce on us when we come to worship him on the day he is set apart above every other. He comes to join us. He comes to abide within and through us. He chooses to fellowship with us. He brings us into his family. Indeed, at the beginning of every sacred worship hour, we invoke his presence. Do we believe? I, I mean really believe that he's here. that he's inviting our worship of him, that he's accepting our worship of him. The truth that should inform our worship as found in God's inspired word is that he is altogether holy. Earlier, I read two passages from the Old Testament. The stories of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4 and Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10. The first story is an example of both acceptable and unacceptable worship. Cain and Abel both worshipped God. Abel did as God directed. Cain tried to worship in the way he saw fit. The result, your Bible says that the Lord respected Abel and his offering and disrespected Cain and his offering. The difference? Scripture answers that question. Abel offered his sacrifice by faith and Cain did not. And in Romans 10, 17, we read, So then faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing how? By the word of God. So where did Abel get his faith? By the word of God. Now granted, the word of God took a different form in his day. He didn't have the 66 books we have. But God had communicated clearly what the expectations were. This is a critical matter if we wish to have our worship accepted or respected by the Lord. If we worship God by faith, which was the key to Abel's acceptance, 
we will worship as the word of God directs. There's another important text that applies to worship. We read in Romans 14, 23, the last part, for whatever is not from faith is what? Sin. If our worship is not by faith, that is, it is not by the word of God, then it is what? Sin. It will be rejected just like Cain's. The story of Nadab and Abihu offers another critical lesson in proper worship. The sons of Aaron, the high priest, were well trained in their priestly roles in the tabernacle. But apparently, in a drunken stupor, they decide to exhibit a little levity, to step outside the boundaries a bit, to let their guard down, to offer unauthorized fire, which God had not commanded them, quotes. And you know the outcome. When Aaron discovered his sons had perished at God's hand, he spoke with Moses inquiring about God's furious reaction. And Moses reminded Aaron that God had said he must be regarded as holy by all who approach him. You see, God will not be trifled with. It's a very serious matter when we choose to worship the king on our terms and not his. There are some of us sitting here today who enjoy a pick-and-choose approach to worship. We accept what we like from Scripture and reject what we don't like. Then we want to pile on preferences and practices from non-biblical sources. Tradition, false religions, social mores. The list is endless. And then we want to baptize it all and label it as good. There's even a term for this practice that theologians use. It's not in the Bible. It's the word syncretism. Theologians apply it to an amalgamation of different religious beliefs and cultures and schools of thought. I saw online the other day A heading that said, learn 500 ways to worship. Oh, okay. But the Bible has news for us. When we consider the common elements of both the Genesis and Leviticus stories, the primary lesson that jumps off those pages, so to speak, is that God does not accept all forms of worship that are offered to him. That's a scary thought to many. Because they say, well, well but what if our worship is not acceptable? What if it's displeasing or offensive to him? And then they remember Hebrews 12.29 that says the consequence is a consuming fire. Well, if we stop there, you'd have a right to go home worried to death. But thankfully, God's message doesn't end there. Don't spend a lot of your time trying to define unacceptable worship in God's eyes. Rather, spend your time getting to know him as your king more and more each day. Once you encounter the majesty of God, 
truly encounter him through his word, you can't help but respond with reverence and awe. The Apostle John tells of a day when every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as in the sea and all that are in them will say blessing and what? Honor and what? Glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for how long? Forever and ever. I want to be there. on that day, on all of those days, forever and ever, part of the congregation of the redeemed. And I want to be there to honor the king. Do you?